By the beginning of our era, there were around 10 Mayan cities all competing with each other, and Tikal was determined to stand out. These pyramids are a center of power, and one that provides a fine spectacle. To sort of think of it as a stage, but also as a complex, doesn't make any sense to the individual pieces. You put them together and it's pretty impressive. These pyramids form a ceremonial center, an urban nucleus where all the inhabitants gathered on the occasion of the great rituals that bound the community to its sovereign. We know that they would go down those great stairways with their hands bleeding because they had done genital bloodletting up above, and they would go down these huge stairways. The people would gather in the squares at the foot of the pyramids to witness these rites and hear the sovereign's predictions. But the Mayan population was mainly agricultural, and it was a scattered one. How did they know when to meet up in the city center? They saw it in the stars. The Mayans have a cyclical conception of time based on the observation of the stars. They believe that the past, the present, and the future are all linked, and that only rituals intended to satisfy the gods on specific dates can predict the future. So astronomy has become the basis for divinatory calendars, which define the dates of these rituals that are obligatory to attend. In fact, the Mayans had several calendars. They basically had a 365-day solar calendar. They also had a ritual calendar that was not directly related to the sun, since it was composed of 260 days. And they had to combine these two calendars. But to achieve the precision of these calendars of theirs, the Mayans must have had an amazing knowledge of astronomy. The Mayans were passionate about astronomy, and they very early on had a sacred center for the study of the paths of the stars, a mythical group of monumental pyramids known as the Lost World. This group, located southwest of the North Acropolis, is the second nucleus of the ancient city. Most intriguingly, at the center of the group stands a pyramid 100 feet tall with sides 250 feet long at their base. It was originally decorated with stucco masks of jaguars in pairs and shows traces of color mostly red. Red is the color of the east and of the sunrise. It celebrates the birth of the sun and of life itself. Most of these temples were painted really bright red, so they were very impressive. Mayan buildings were actually brightly colored. The color palette is immense. We know about it today thanks to fragments of stucco recovered from several sites. We know that there were not only red and black, but also purple, pink, ochre, greens, and blues. The reason we think of them as red and black is because those are the pigments that are best preserved. This pyramid in the lost world with four staircases has, strangely, no temple at the top. Why could this be? It is, in fact, a platform for observing the stars, in particular, the sun. To the east, it faces three small constructions that are linked together and aligned north-south. You could see the sunrise from here. The sun in the left corner of the north building indicated the summer solstice, June the 21st. It rose behind the middle one at the spring and autumn equinoxes. 
and it rose at the right corner of the one to the south at the winter solstice, the 21st of December. The course of the sun, of the moon, of Venus, the Mayan priests observed them all. These observations made it possible to define the best dates for sowing or harvesting. What perhaps defines the Mayans more than anything else is that they increasingly associated their astronomical observations with arithmetic, since they were also mathematicians. They even made predictions. We know, for example, that they predicted eclipses of all kinds thousands of years ahead. And remember that this was all just with the naked eye, because they had no optical devices, and using architectural elements like the lost world that are markers of solstices and equinoxes. From the 3rd to the 9th centuries AD, Tikal went through an extraordinary development. The real golden age of the city started at the end of the 7th century. It now ruled over as many as 2 million people, and its influence extended over dozens of cities, towns, and villages. Beyond the site, an initial radius of 10 square miles was enough for day-to-day -day trade. Farmers went to local markets up to a day's walk away. Throughout its history, Tikal also developed its relations, especially political ones, with distant cities like Copan in Honduras, Caracol in Belize, and even Teotihuacan, more than 600 miles to the west in Mexico. The beginning of the year 378 would mark a major turning point. Teotihuacan, 600 miles away and considered the greatest metropolis of Central America, extended all its contacts far afield and may even have invaded Tikal. Well, in the, in the late fourth century, there's this contact, interaction, uh, invasion, something with Teotihuacan, which to understand the importance of that, you'd have to see Teotihuacan. It's this great city in central Mexico that was involved all over, huge uh, economic uh, system, pulling in resources, and uh, the pyramids, they're just huge, everything's huge. And so it was a very impressive place. But what I believe is that um, after this contact, the incoming person with the leader, with the Teotihuacan sort of associations and roots, he kills the king, but then he marries his, his daughter. Then he's a Maya Teotihuacan offspring. Many experts are still wondering what the point was for the powerful Teotihuacan of invading Tikal, 600 miles away. As a city, Tikal was an example for the others. Most likely, at the time the other cities were all talking about Tikal, just like people all over its empire spoke of Rome. They'd have been talking about its grandeur, its huge buildings, its art, its ceremonies, its political activities. Now, people say they invaded it because they wanted to have trade. There's nothing that they would want. The tropical forest is resource de deficient in terms of non-food products. It doesn't have any hard rock. It doesn't have any obsidian or pyrite or jade. And all that stuff was imported from the highlands, and that's the the importance of Tikal can be compared to that of the world's major metropolises of our own day and age, such as London, Paris, New York, or Shanghai. It was a center of political, economic, and cultural power, influencing the whole of Middle America. Tikal had a lot of influence. Tikal may well have been invaded because of its prestige and its great fame. 
it is easy to see how Teotihuacan may have wanted to tighten its grip on the Mayan world. Then and after that, there are lots of architecture and things that have Teotihuacan modified style of this great Mexican city. From then on, Tikal incorporates elements of the invaders' culture into its own, and their influence on the city only leads to further development. At its northeast corner, at the foot of the central acropolis, this two-roomed building, probably a temple, is a perfect example of this, especially since it was built 400 years after the invasion. The platform on which it stands reproduces the embankments typical of Teotihuacan architecture. The fact that it was built so long after Teotihuacan first got involved in Tikal's affairs shows how long-lasting an effect the Mexican metropolis had on Mayan lands. But Tikal had long before become a major city, with many outlying towns, villages, and hamlets, and migrating workers who'd come to build the monuments had further swelled its population. This was the heyday of Tikal, with the best architecture, the biggest pyramids, the thickest stucco. In terms of the late technologies of pre-classical times, it's magnificent. Tikal had a population of more than 60,000, and the heart of the site covers an area just six square miles. This is surrounded by an intermediary zone that gives way to a rural belt of 23 square miles that is both residential and agricultural. Its victories over rival cities have increased its power. Between city-states, armed conflicts or alliances to establish the power of kings were frequent events between nobles or ruling families, for the Mayans were warriors as well. The idea of war is an interesting one, because for a long time it was thought that the Mayans were peaceful, with a theocratic state, and dedicated only to studying the stars. And it wasn't until the mid-20th century that we began to study them closer, and to notice how many representations there are of people with weapons of war. Or where the king has a captive at his feet, sometimes even under his feet, being trampled by him. A great king was measured by the number of warriors he was able to take captive. And closer studies have revealed that the Mayans were always at war, just like any other society on Earth. In Tikal, Tributes, conquests, and marriages have provided the new rulers with considerable resources and given fresh momentum to construction. 